is Mystery Meats Fine Dining Podcast, helping foodies discover new restaurants and new friends. Here's your host, the founder of Mystery Meat, Seth Ressler. Hello, and welcome to Mystery Meats Fine Dining Podcast. I'm your host. My name is Seth Ressler. This is the podcast for foodies who love travel and travelers who love food. And this week, we're doing something uh, really different and exciting. We're actually going up to Seattle, and we're going to talk to Dominic Cura. He's the author of Eternally Gluten-Free, which is a cookbook full of gluten-free recipes. And he also runs the website eternallyglutenfree.com. What's really amazing about him, though, he's only 13 years old. So we're going to talk to him about how he found out that he uh, had celiac disease and needed to eat gluten-free foods. Uh, we'll talk to him about his website, his cookbook. Then we'll talk to him a little bit about what it's like to go out dining when you have to eat gluten-free, and we'll play out of the frying pan. So, Dominic, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And congratulations on the cookbook. That's absolutely fantastic. Thanks. You know, you have now written more books in the last year than I've read. <laughs> Take me through how you found out that you had to eat gluten-free. Let's start at the beginning. You were diagnosed in 2009. Before that, you were eating things with gluten in them. And what was it doing to you? I mean, physically, how were you feeling? And how did you know something was not right? One of the biggest things was I had lots of leg pains in my bones and my ankles. And it would hurt a lot. And I couldn't really walk or sleep. It was really hard because it would happen at night a lot. And also, I would get dark bags under my eyes. And I'd be really tired. Uh-huh. And uh, there's more severe symptoms, and mine weren't that bad. How old were you at this point? I was nine. Okay, and this had been going on for a couple of years? Mm -hmm. Was it hard to diagnose? I mean, when you went to doctors, did they figure it out pretty quickly? or? No, it was actually pretty hard. It took um, a few months to guess that I had celiac disease. I had to get a blood test, and that came out positive. And just to make sure, I had to get a biopsy. And so they took a sample of my intestine, where celiac disease takes place. Mm -hmm. And it also came out positive, and so I had celiac disease. So what are the signs that people should be looking for that might tip you off that you have celiac disease? Some of the common ones are diarrhea, growth problems, bone problems too, weight loss. Well, there's actually lots of symptoms, except some people don't even have symptoms, and yet they actually have celiac disease. I was reading some of the stuff that you were sending me in emails, and you actually said, what is it, like 98% of people who have celiac disease don't know? Is that right? Yeah, 95% of people with celiac disease don't know they have it. That's unbelievable. And it sounds like it's hard to diagnose. I mean, like you take go to doctors and say, this is what, you know, what's happening to me, and they, they don't necessarily jump to celiac disease. No, they don't. So they do the blood test, they do the biopsy, you find out that that's what it is. At that point, I mean, how do you feel about it? Is it a relief because you know, or is it, like, what's going through your mind? Well, at first... I don't really know what to think because everything I was uh, used to eating, all those cereals and stuff, I could now not eat ever again. And even though I was kind of not too happy about that, later on, like a, a few months after, I started appreciating it because I found good stuff. Like instead of greenness pasta, I would eat quinoa pasta. And I just love quinoa pasta and the nuttiness like the quinoa has. And I find that better than regular greenness pasta. Yep. And also I started a blog from it a few months after I was diagnosed. And I wrote a book. And so if I never had celiac disease, none of this would ever have happened. So there was definitely a silver lining to it all. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I want to talk about the blog and I want to talk about the book. But before we do, I mean, for people who don't know, what is celiac disease exactly? What does that mean? Celiac disease, it's an autoimmune disorder, not an allergy. When you have celiac disease and you eat gluten, which is wheat, rye, or barley, it goes down the intestine. And the body thinks that gluten is bad for the body. And they don't collect nutrients, and then people get sick from it. And when you say it's not an allergy, it's a disease, what does that mean? Like, what's the difference? Allergies, you can eventually grow out of them, but with celiac disease, you're stuck with it forever. So this is not a temporary thing. You'll never be able to eat gluten. No. <laughs> uh, so you're diagnosed, you find out this is what it is. Is that the solution? I mean, is that all there is? You just stop eating gluten? Like, yeah. Do you need to take any medications or anything like that? The only cure is to go gluten-free forever. And were you able to do that right away, or was that a hard transition? It was pretty hard, because everything I liked, I could never eat again. And especially at birthday parties and stuff, everyone would be eating cake, and I just had to sit out and not eat any of it. Yeah, and, and 
you know, I mean, anybody who's ever died it knows how hard that is. I mean, that's it's like almost an impossible thing to do. But you have to do it for a much more serious reason, obviously. Yeah. You come home, you find out that you've been diagnosed. How does that affect your family and, and the meals that they prepared? Well, my family, they decided not to go gluten-free. It would be especially hard for my brothers, too, because they love all the gluten stuff. Yep. <laughs> But we do sometimes make stuff that is gluten-free because it can get harder to make gluten-free and gluten stuff. Like when we're making pasta, my mom would have to make two different pots because you can't cross-contaminate it either. And so it would be pretty hard. You know, now we're walking through the grocery store. What's off the list? It's actually pretty hard because lots of stuff has secret ingredients that have wheat in it. Like maltodextrin and natural flavors would have wheat in it. And so you wouldn't be too sure about certain stuff. And at first, it was just super hard trying to find something I could eat. So what are some of those things that we might not think have gluten in, but they really do? Soy sauce actually has gluten in it. Also, lipstick has um, gluten in it. So, so you're not wearing lipstick anymore, huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> so. Yeah, and then... All right, so then walk me through, a, you know, a menu for a basic day. You get up, what are you having for breakfast? At first, I would just find these organic, natural cereals and stuff, and it wouldn't always taste too good. And then eventually, I found Chex cereal, and all of them except for the wheat Chex is gluten-free. So cereal's not completely off the list? No. Okay, so that's breakfast. What do you do for lunch? Well, pretty much for the last four years, I've been having peanut butter and jelly, because I can't really find anything else to eat, and I'm kind of a picky eater. But it's also really hard to bread. And then eventually, I found another bread called Udi's. And it's the best bread ever, except the problem is every gluten-free bread is super small. And so you have to eat lots of bread to feel fill. So you're doing a couple of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches on gluten-free bread for lunch. Yeah. Uh, and then dinners. What's, what's on the list? What, you know, what are your favorite dinners to have and make? I like pasta, and we have that lots of times. We also have steak more than a lot of times. I'm kind of getting sick of it. <laughs> and then... <laughs> but... but Meat is okay, right? I mean, meat, yeah. fish, chicken, that all that kind of stuff is fine. Unless it's like marinated in certain stuff like soy sauce. And then vegetables are all in the clear? Yeah. And fruits are all in the clear? Mm -hmm. So as you start to change your diet and become gluten-free, how long does that take for physical changes and the ailments that you had? Like, what was the effect? I think it takes a few months to go back to normal. You have to be careful because you have to have less than 10 ppm of gluten. If you have more than that then you'd get sick. And what's a PPM? I mean, how, what, what is that? How much are we talking, really? Parts per million. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So not a lot is what you're no. saying. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So it takes a couple months, and, and you saw the leg pain go away. Yeah. And sleeping became better. Mm -hmm. And what about the bags under your eyes? Yeah, those went away. And then if, if you do have gluten, do you notice it right away? I mean, is, is there an obvious physical change that shows up right away? Like, what happens? Like an hour after, I'd start getting headaches or leg pain. Yep. And it would just be really annoying. And Gotcha. And do you find that it sneaks into things randomly? Is it hard to stay away from completely because it just yeah. shows up? And... <laughs> like, at first, I was really picky and trying to make sure not to eat anything. Yep. Because it's gotten so hard sometimes that I wouldn't be like so picky about it. So tell me about your decision to start a blog about all this. Well, it started a few months after I was diagnosed. I found out that it wasn't actually that bad. And so I wanted to show people that it wasn't that bad because lots of people really felt bad because of it. And so I think it was my gastroenterologist. She said I should start a blog. And so I started doing a blog and I would share just green free updates. And then I started um, adding recipes. And I've checked out your blog. Your blog is awesome, by the way. Thanks. And who's doing the photographs? Is that you? I am. <laughs> Those are fantastic. Those are really, really good. Thanks. And so you started posting these recipes. And are these recipes that you've developed yourself? Yeah, all of them I made by myself. What do you do? Do you take a, an existing recipe and modify it? Or what's the process? If it's something like really complex, like let's say croissant, I would look up on the internet what makes a croissant. Like it has lots of butter. So I would, on a notepad, I would just write butter and they find all the ingredients and then I would try and find out how much I would need it by guessing and sometimes it wouldn't turn out too good and sometimes it turned out fabulous. <laughs> <And> <laughs> so there's a lot of experimentation. There's a lot of trial and error in here, right? Yeah, like one time I made angel food cake after taking it out of the oven. It wouldn't come out of the bun pan. Oof. And it was rock hard. 
And so then I eventually had to throw out the whole band because it was stuck in the pan. <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> and you couldn't get it out at all, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> so how did the blog become a cookbook? I wanted to write a story about how I live with celiac disease. Yep. And how I appreciated it. Except I couldn't write like a whole book about it because it's only been four years. And so I put the idea aside. And then after a few weeks, I got the idea of compiling a cookbook of my gluten-free recipes with a short story of my life with celiac disease. And you've self-published the cookbook, and it's now available in bookstores in Seattle, right? And hopefully other places. Oh, good. Can people get it online? Yeah. Oh, where can they go? Where, where do they go to get that? Well, just Amazon, and I think Barnes & Noble online also. Tell me a little bit about the book. Who is it for? Who's the intended audience for this book? Uh, mostly for kids and teens who have celiac disease and just aren't too happy about it and need some gluten-free recipes. But it's pretty much also for everyone, because even though we gluten free recipes, they're not that different from regular recipes, except for the fact that they have different flours. All right, so what's your favorite recipe in the cookbook? It's truthfully, it's an Italian Christmas dessert, and they're little balls of dough that are fried and then dipped in honey and formed into a dome and then sprinkled with sprinkles. And it's really decorative and creative and really tasty. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And we should point out the entire book is sweets, right? I mean, you've got, you've got a real yeah. sweet tooth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, very cool. Um, so the book is called Eternally Gluten-Free. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you a little bit about what it's like to go out dining uh, when you're gluten-free. So we'll come back and do that in just a moment. By the way, before we get back to Dominic, I do want to let you know what Mystery Meat is. Mystery Meat is a group of foodies who get together and they go try a new restaurant. But there's a catch. And the catch is this. They don't know where they're going until 24 hours in advance. So you buy your tickets, you got no idea where it is. You just know that you're going to show up and have a good meal with a, a bunch of great foodies like yourself. We are now doing these dinners in Boston. We're doing them in San Francisco. And in January, we're going to launch our Seattle chapter. So we hope you come out. If you want a Mystery Meat dinner in your town, or if you want to attend one of those, all you have to do is go to mysterymeat.org and click the big orange button that says get an invitation. And we'd love to have you. We're talking to Dominic Cura. He is the author of Eternally Gluten-Free. It is both a website and a cookbook full of his stories of what it's like to uh, be gluten-free and to uh, eat without gluten when you have celiac disease and also a bunch of recipes, uh, sweet recipes, uh, which are fantastic. And we should point out, you're only 13 years old. And you're an accomplished author already. Do you go to book signings? Do people ask you to autograph the, their copy of your book? Um, I kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I want to talk to you a little bit about dining and going out to restaurants. Mm -hmm. When you know that you can't eat gluten, what is the process when it comes time to go out to a restaurant? So it's not always so easy. And usually I have to research it ahead of time to find a restaurant that actually has good gluten-free tasting food. And then other times if I go there, it would be really hard because I have to just find certain stuff on the menu. I'd have to take off certain stuff, like the dressing or the sauce, and it would have no taste at all. And so it would be really hard and annoying lots of times. And I remember lots of dinners being really frustrated because I couldn't really eat any good food while everyone else was eating good food. <laughs> so it takes a lot of planning, it sounds like. Yeah. Is it easy to go online and find out if a restaurant is gluten-free? Like, can you just go to Yelp or something and find that out? Or, or how do you figure it out? Yelp does have a gluten-free option of finding restaurants, except... Some other places do have gluten-free menus, and I really appreciate those restaurants that do have those because it makes it much easier. Now, does a place have to have a gluten-free menu for you to eat there, or are there certain things that you know you can always get if you go to uh, you know, a place without a gluten-free menu? It doesn't have to have a gluten-free menu. Like I said before, I take off certain ingredients. Like if you want a hamburger, I could ask to take off the bun. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not as filling or tasty. Wait. That's what I have to do. <laughs> right. And I think one restaurant, they served it with a lettuce wrap instead. So who are the all-stars then? Who are the restaurants chains that you know have gluten-free menus? Um, I know Chipotle does. Chipotle's a fantastic restaurant for things yeah, like that, Yeah, it's really too. good. You know, you're up there in Seattle. I asked you to make a restaurant recommendation. So tell me about the restaurant that you chose. I chose Razi's Pizzeria in Greenwood in Seattle. And I chose this restaurant because it has a whole gluten-free menu. Pizza, pasta, and sandwiches like paninis and gyros and grinders. They even have pita bread, which I've never seen before being gluten-free. 
This is amazing because these are a lot of the items that I'll bet you can't normally get. I mean, these sound like very bread-based items. Yeah. When I found out about Rossi's, I was super happy because it just felt like I could eat anything I wanted to. So what is your favorite thing on the menu? Well, I don't really have a favorite because it's just too hard to choose. But <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what, I, I guess, what should we try? The first time we go there, okay. what, do you, what, what should we start with? The chicken marsala pasta. And for the appetizers, you should definitely try the pita bread because it's just amazing finding gluten-free pita bread. And also, for dessert, you definitely want to have the caramel butterscotch pie. That sounds good. Even though it sounds really sweet, it's really, really good. Oh, nice, nice. So, Dominic, are you ready to play a game? Uh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right, this game is called Out of the Frying Pan. Here's how it works. I'm going to ask you for a bunch of recommendations. You just tell me the first thing that pops into your mind. You ready to play? Yep. Uh, You're up there in Seattle. Tell me what foods is Seattle known for? It's known for lots of salmon and fish. It's also known for uh, lots of organic, natural, vegan foods. <laughs> People are healthy up there, huh? Yeah, pretty healthy. Nice. Which is also good because they have lots of gluten-free stuff, too. Oh, good. <laughs> it's also known for coffee, too, because of Starbucks and everything. So I lived in Seattle for a little while, and I did not drink coffee until I lived in Seattle. But when the sun doesn't come out, <laughs> you need a reason to get up in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Now, are you a coffee drinker? A uh, frappuccino drinker. <laughs> oh, look at you. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned the seafood, which is great up there in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, mm-hmm. Where's the best place to go buy seafood? Definitely Pike Place Market in downtown. They have somewhat different places to get seafood from, and it's the famous place where the, the people throw around the fish. Yeah, so you see that on TV every now and then. That's Pike's Place Market when you see that. This yeah. is, it, it's this cool sort of open-air market. And, and um, mm-hmm. I went there once, and they have this big, ugly-looking fish, you know, and they still have the head on and everything. Mm-hmm. And the guy actually had, like, a stick running underneath the ice that the fish was resting on. And he uh, was yeah, holding yeah. it. And couldn't, have, has this happened to you? <laughs> and you walk by, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden the fish jumps out at you because he uses the stick to <laughs> move it. And I screamed. <laughs> I freaked out. <laughs> all right. Pike's Place Market. Yes, definitely. Great place to get seafood. What about foodie events up in Seattle? Do you have a favorite foodie event that you've been to? I guess by to Seattle because there's so much food there. <laughs> And they actually have lots of gluten-free food options. Even at the food festivals, you see that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so tell me about Bite of Seattle. What happens there? Um, they just have lots of different vendors selling their food there, and they have people doing cooking demonstrations. And speaking of cooking demonstrations, last summer I did a cooking demonstration with Terry Radaru. I made my cherry cupcakes with him on stage. Oh, very cool! That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about chefs? Any chefs that we should know about? Any chefs that you like there in Seattle? Well, Thierry Radaru, he was on the Top Chef TV show. He's the one I did the demonstration with. And also Tom Douglas, he owns multiple restaurants around Seattle. Tell me how you hooked up and wound up doing this demonstration. Like, how did they find you? It was actually a contest and you would submit a video of you baking something. And it wasn't supposed to be for kids, except I decided to do it and see what happened. Yeah. And uh, I found out I won. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, that's really cool. What about food trucks? Are you seeing those in Seattle? And, uh, you know, are there any that are gluten-free that you're able to eat from? In Seattle, there are these two food trucks that I really like. There's I Love My GFF. You can find it in South Lake Union, and it's really good and has quinoa bowls. Ooh. And then there's also Urban Nomad, and they have pasta and stuff. And I tried their pasta once, and it was so amazing. It didn't taste like gluten-free pasta at all. It had a great taste and texture. Oh, that's fantastic. All right, last question. Make your pitch. Why should foodies come to the city of Seattle? I think foodies should come because you can find lots of different types of food everywhere, including seafood and salmon. So if you're a seafood fan, this is the city to go to. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, You know, the the best thing I ever had in Seattle, I remember, was Copper River salmon. What was explained to me is, you know, the Copper River is up in Alaska and it's the salmon and you can only get it for like a two week window during the year. But Mm -hmm. the salmon actually eat, I guess it's the, the shrimp in the river at that particular time of year. And so something about what the salmon are eating give them this fantastic flavor. And the only place I've ever found it was there in Seattle, but it was huge the couple weeks that it was available in Seattle. It was fantastic. (laughs) All right, Dominic Cura, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Your website is eternallyglutenfree.com. The cookbook is called eternallyglutenfree.com. And you said people can get it online at Amazon and Barnes & Noble? Mm Mm-hmm. 
Uh, Dominic, thank you so much for talking to me. I mean, this is a really important issue, and I think that this is something that, you know, if people are going through, um, you know, it's important for them to know that there are options and that there are things that are available. So Mm -hmm. I really appreciate you putting this all together and talking to us about it. Thank you. My name is Seth Ressler. This is the Fine Dining Podcast. A couple of notes. If you want to go to one of our Mystery Meat dinners or you want a Mystery Meat dinner to come to your town, all you have to do is go to mysterymeat.org. Click the big orange button that says get an invitation. You can't miss it. Sign up. Uh, Also, if you want any of the links that Dominic uh, and I talked about, you can find them on the Mystery Meat website. You can also follow Mystery Meat on Facebook or on Twitter. Uh, And finally, if you like this podcast, go over to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. Say nice things about us. We like that. Uh, If you are a blogger or a food event organizer or a 13-year-old author of a cookbook about gluten-free recipes, uh, please reach out to us. Uh, Click the Contact Us link on the Mystery Meat website and send us an email. We would love to have you as a guest on the podcast. Thank you so much. Appreciate you listening. This has been Mystery Meat's Fine Dining Podcast. You can find links to the websites mentioned in this episode at mysterymeat.org slash podcast. Thank you for listening.